Help support AMTV by becoming a patron, an AMTV staff member, and following us over on Twitter. Welcome. It's six o'clock on Sunday, March the 30th, and this is Five. In 1997, Channel 5 burst onto our screens, promising a service that was modern, faster, in tune with the younger generation, whilst providing a lineup of programmes that would be entertaining for all. Over the last 25 years, that image, you could argue, has been toned down somewhat, as current day 5 feels more in line with its main competition. But back then, Britain's fifth free television channel was given extensive promotion in readiness for its launch, and what better way to kick off your new channel than collaborating with the biggest girl group in the world. To understand how we got to this monumental moment, let's go back to the 1980s. In November 1982, Channel 4 launched onto the UK airwaves. It was new, bold, and it promised to do things a little differently, presenting outside-of-the-box programming in its own distinct style, in contrast to what was being done by ITV and the BBC. After some years, once Channel 4 had found their footing, discussions began regarding the possibility of a fifth terrestrial channel. The realm of satellite TV was gradually beginning to take off, granting viewers a freedom from the threshold of just four accessible channels. However, the cost of installation, as well as the service packages that were available, cost quite a bit of money, so the prospect of a new free channel definitely would have held some appeal. By 1987, a new study was launched by the government to determine the appetite for a fifth channel. Arguments for the endeavour stressed that there would be no extra cost to the viewer. There'd be increased competition amongst the commercial broadcasters, as well as the cost of advertising coming down as a result. It all seemed like a win-win, right? Well, as you'd expect, there were some issues. The prospective fifth channel would run on the ultra-high frequency, or UHF, that was in use at the time. Through this, it was estimated that two-thirds of the UK population would be able to receive the fifth channel, though this would still leave a good chunk of people with nothing but a distorted signal, or worse, nothing at all. It was also stressed that existing equipment, such as video recorders, may have to be retuned in order to be able to receive and stably carry the signal that the fifth channel would utilise. Such a prospect would be an insanely expensive one to carry out, and as the 80s bid farewell, there wasn't any major updates in regards to when, or even if, a fifth channel would make its way to air. The proposal is in the new broadcasting bill published today, which contains plans for sweeping changes to television and radio. The government says that the plans will mean more choice for the viewer. Critics say quality will suffer. 1990 proved to be a huge year for the broadcasting world in the UK, as the Broadcasting Act of 1990 was passed by Parliament. Amongst its many sweeping changes, it stated that a fifth channel would be established, and the means of who would operate the service would come down to competitive means, essentially a bidding and pitching war. After several years of back and forth and various companies bidding for the licence, the process was finally settled in the spring of 1996, with Channel 5 Broadcasting LTD being the lucky winners. So now the fifth channel could get underway, right? Wrong. Remember I mentioned earlier about the retuning equipment? Well, in the 1990 Broadcasting Act, it stated that should such a task be undertaken, the cost would fall to the licensee, not the consumer. So now if they wanted to get themselves on the air, Channel 5 Broadcasting would have to pay for and carry out the work required in millions of homes, just so viewers would be able to see their newly won station. It was estimated that between 9 and 10 million homes would need to be visited making it one of the largest door-to-door -door operations in British history. As the retuning began, promotion for what was to be definitively called Channel 5 started in earnest. The Give Me 5 campaigns were quite striking, and certainly sparked interest amongst television viewers, who at some point or another would likely receive a knock at the door from someone looking to retune their kit. Channel 5 were working as fast as they could to meet a prospective launch date of New Year's Day 1997. But as more equipment needed attending to, and the cost skyrocketed, the timing was looking increasingly shaky. By September of 1996, the new challenger admitted defeat, stating that the launch date would now come in the March of 1997. This may have been disappointing at the time, but if it meant making sure the maximum amount of households would be able to watch 5 when it did make its grand debut, then it must have been worth the delay. For those whose equipment had been retuned successfully, 
they could occasionally catch some of Channel 5's test transmissions, which offered a highlight reel and a glimpse into the kind of programming that would be shown when the station eventually got started. Behind the scenes, presenters were being hired, schedules were being crafted, and perhaps most notably, the launch night was being worked out. Rather than just throw up the station's ident and move straight into the news or a trailer reel to showcase how up to date Channel 5 would be, they'd need something different. Something eye catching. Something memorable. They'd need a song. They'd need the Spice Girls. The Fabulous Five themselves. The Spice Girls had burst onto the music scene in 1996 in the most spectacular way imaginable. Their debut single, Wannabe, topped the charts around the world. Their debut album, Spice, also topped the charts and would become the best-selling album in the world for the year of 1997. It went on to become the best-selling album ever by a girl group, with staggering sales of over 23 million. The following three singles after Wannabe, those being Say You'll Be There, Two Become One, and the double A side of Mama and Who Do You Think You Are, all went to number one. So by the time 1997 began, it's fair to say that the Spice Girls were on top of the world. Hype was at its peak, with people comparing it to the Beatlemania of the 1960s. Girl power was here and ready to stay. And rest assured, if your project had any kind of endorsement or involvement from Victoria, Emma, Jerry, Mel B and Mel C, then you were sure to have a hit. Fitting then, that Channel 5 would enlist the talents of the girls to record a brand new promotional single for the new service. A song that would stay true to their pop roots while simultaneously introducing and promoting Channel 5 to the youngest generations. With the new song recorded, the music video shot, the stage was now set for Britain to welcome its fifth free television channel. Welcome, it's six o'clock on Sunday, March the 30th, and this is Five. Now that is how you launch a TV channel. Granted, it is the most late 90s thing under the sun, but it's a good little slice of fun, isn't it? The Spice Girls are in full force here, embodying everything that made their brand so appealing in the first place. They're upbeat, full of energy, and all about that girl power. The power of five as a song is okay. Given you have the Spice Girls at your disposal, I'm surprised that this was the finished result. Don't get me wrong, the reversal and homage to Manfred Mann's 54321 is a clever little gimmick and one that fits the new station. The title also fits in seamlessly to both Channel 5 itself and the Spice Girls brand. The power of five could refer to the group themselves and the unstoppable power they had on the world at that time, but it also refers to the new service and the power its programs would seemingly have on its viewing audience. And before you ask, no, I have no idea what these orange blob things are, why do they have nipples? Your guess is as good as mine. And this is Five. The words launching Britain's newest channel, and the first entertainment, a new video by the Spice Girls. A rather famous Five launching Channel Five in London. Like the Spice Girls, Britain's newest network is being marketed as modern and popular. 
A special song by the Spice Girls heralded the new channel. Young and colourful, they sum up its image. Channel 5 calls it modern mainstream. The power of five became the talking point of the new channel's launch. Any fan of the Spice Girls would have been clamouring to see their idols grace their screens, and many of them would be tuned in. That is, if they could receive Channel 5 at all. Not even the feature of the biggest girl group in the world could prevent or solve the news service's existing problems when it came to audience reach. All the way back in the late 80s, it had been predicted that around a third of the population wouldn't be able to receive Channel 5 right out of the gate, and it seems that a decade later, in 1997, that prediction came to pass. Here, Channel 5, Britain's first new terrestrial television station for 15 years, has gone on the air. But the channel admits a quarter of viewers won't be able to receive it, and up to 5 million people may need new aerials to get a proper signal. Before going on air, Channel 5's had to retune almost 10 million videos at a cost of £150 million, three times what was expected. Five's programme should reach about three quarters of the population, living in the orange areas but much of Scotland, Wales and large parts of England won't be able to get it. Competitors such as the BBC, ITV and Sky all covered Channel 5's launch, but a prominent part of their coverage centred around the signalling problems. Despite the huge retuning operation, one that had cost Channel 5 hundreds of millions of pounds, not only could many viewers not get the new service, but even many who could were subject to a fuzzy or barely recognisable picture. This would be an issue that Channel 5 would have to tackle and solve over the next few years, but in the short term, they were finally up and running. So, how did things go over with the audiences who could watch? It's fair to say both the attraction of a new channel launching, as well as the Spice Girls making an appearance, helped viewing figures hit an early peak. Around 2.5 million viewers watched The Power of Five, as well as the introductory promotional program, This Is Five. Numbers gradually declined as the night went on, but Channel 5 would claim they got more viewers on their opening night than Channel 4 had done 15 years prior. For the Spice Girls, this would surely be another number one smash, their fifth no less. It would be appropriate, wouldn't it? Well, amazingly, this song didn't hit number one. In fact, it didn't make the top 10. Or the top 40. It didn't chart at all. But that's because from what I can tell, The Power of Five was never released for the public to buy. I've scanned across the internet and I can't find so much as a promotional CD, never mind any kind of official release. Granted, from what we saw and heard on launch night, the song barely clocks in at over 90 seconds, hardly the length needed for a single release of the late 1990s. I know I personally didn't think much of the song, but to not release it in any kind of capacity to promote Channel 5's launch at the very least? That's bizarre. Channel 4 could release its theme music on vinyl, the King Singers released a single in tandem with the BBC where they spent three minutes singing a public service announcement. Yes, that's real. But Channel 5 couldn't release their promo track featuring the Spice Girls? You're telling me a Spice Girls song of any kind wouldn't have sold by the boatload in 1997? Truth be told, there's an infinite amount of reasons as to why a single may have never made its way onto shop shelves, either on CD or cassette. And perhaps it's for the best, as when their next official single was released, that would indeed become their fifth consecutive UK number one. Perhaps you've heard of it. After the dust had settled, the Spice Girls emerged from the Channel 5 collaboration relatively the same as when they entered it. They continued to dominate the British charts, with Spice Up Your Life kicking off a successful run of their singles from their second album, Spice World. Two more number one singles would follow, in the form of Too Much and Viva Forever, with the remaining single, Stop, falling short one spot at number two. By the turn of the millennium, they had disbanded but they've reunited in some form or another every now and then for a series of gigs or tours. The Spice Girls brand remains just as strong and popular as it ever had been in the mid to late 90s. Girl power is still very much in effect. Appropriately enough, Channel 5 is hoping for a 5% share of all television viewing. If it gets it, commercial success should be assured. If it doesn't, all that modern mainstream programming will need rapid rethinking. From the start, this will be television's most cost-conscious channel. Well, it's got tiny pockets compared to the other broadcasters. ITV spends £800 million a year on programming. They've only got £110 million to play with. So it could be a real problem. They're going to have to rely heavily on bought-in um, programmes from America and film packages. There's not going to be very much money for original production. Coverage initially is a problem because people have got to get aerials, or some people have got to get, got to get aerials, but uh, I'm sure we can compete. 
Channel 5 hopes to reach 18 million homes within nine months, but Britain's newest station is still unlikely to show any profits for at least two years. For Channel 5, their fate was decidedly more interesting. The angle of being modern, fast and in touch with the younger generations of TV viewers persisted for the remainder of the 90s. Although as the 2000s progressed, you could argue that the Channel 5 image and personality softened out, petering more towards a wide audience as possible, with even some labelling the channel as generic. I wouldn't go that far, but those early days were clearly far behind them. Channel 5 has been able to carve out its space in the world of UK television, and whether you like it or loathe it, it's clearly here to stay firmly settling itself within its peers in the realm of terrestrial television. It may not have had as big of an audience as the BBC or ITV, and it may not have had the same budgets or kinds of programming that they have. But, you could argue, over 25 years since they launched, they have attempted to stick to their original remit as closely as they could. To be that little bit faster, that little bit different. In a similar vein to when Channel 4 launched, 5 wanted to stand out from the crowd. And back in 1997, whether it was the striking advertising, the colourful launch, or even the costly retuning operation to ensure millions could even see it in the first place, Channel 5 will always be known for having one of the most chaotic but culturally brilliant launches of any television channel in the world. Welcome. It's 6 o'clock on Sunday, March the 30th, and this is 5. <laughs> Thank you to our patrons for helping to support the show, and a special thank you to Macra, Bruce Danton, Derek Chambers, Sean Nock, Dord Khan, Liam Domain, AJ Mac 200017, Deck, Jen, Traffy, Tim Ripley, Mr. Eurovision 1986, Ted Elliott, Manal Thurman, John Wakefield, Kieran Bolton, 40 Something Manchild, Jerry Ralph, John McLeod, Subs Khan, Saint Rocket 9, and James Wallace, our AMTV staff members.